Light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. The standard advice for social situations that has been around perhaps forever is that one is not supposed to discuss religion and politics in pleasant company because it provokes too many arguments. I'm not sure that's wise because there are major areas of life that don't get addressed that way, that really need to be talked about, that there needs to be dialogue, there needs to be conversation, but there needs to be mutual respect. For this show, I would like to focus on talking about religion in social context in ways that are that are civil you know what do we have to keep in mind what do we how do we how do we do this without it turning into a bad uh, situation the first thing i think that is easy to overlook because we're such physical creatures we see with our eyes we hear with our ears we touch with our hands we forget how much exists that is beyond those senses that when we're talking about religion of any sort, to consider the possibility that there are people in the room, you know, that depending on how many people are around us, there may be someone who has a completely different religious practice, a different religious background, a different religious history, and or even just a different religious perspective. Even within the same church of the same denomination, of the same branch of Christianity, there, it, is, it is not at all difficult to get people arguing within any congregation because there are different opinions about even the most basic of beliefs. I think salvation means this. Well, I think salvation means that. Well, I think these people will be saved. Well, I think they won't. And on and on it goes. Do we like arguing? Maybe some people do. I, I guess some people like to debate. I don't. I like loving relationships. I like discovering and embracing and adding to wisdom. I like learning how it looks from somebody else's perspective and yet in ways that are not necessarily judgmental to me. Ways that, and, and in a similar respect, if I'm going to respect, if I want them to respect me, I need to respect them enough that I don't make statements that cast judgment upon their perspective. It's not ultimately about right or wrong because when you're discussing religion and theology you're discussing things that are beyond measure things that in many cases can be neither proven nor disproven so there needs to be a certain humility that this is the conclusion to which I have come at this point in my life for these reasons I have thought about it and I know what the reasons are if the only reason you have for believing what you believe is that somebody told you to believe it. If you're doing nothing than parroting your elders or repeating what you were told like a, a stuck tape recorder or a broken record, that, forgive me for sounding judgmental and snobbish, I don't mean to, but that would be unacceptable to Sister Who. As Sister Who, I wrestle with the questions and I ask the questions, sometimes questions that no one else wants to ask, sometimes people who don't want their beliefs questioned because then they would have to examine whether whether they're trying to convince themselves. You know, when you say that this is what God said, this is what God said, this is what God said, are you trying to convince yourself? Are you trying to convince God? Or are you trying to convince me? If I already have a different conclusion and I'm not interested in being persuaded, you're definitely not going to persuade me. So if you repeat it that many times and with that much enthusiasm, part of me wants to step back and say, why is this so important to you? Why does the answer to this, why does this particular answer to this particular question matter so much that you would get all passionate about it? What is it that you feel is at stake? And are you willing to listen to my perspective that may not see that same thing as being at stake. You know, if I don't, if I, well, I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. If I have steak on Fridays, it's a sin, I'll have to go to confession. 
what if that is a belief and someone else says, well, but because I'm not Catholic, I don't share that belief. And if I don't share that belief, does that mean that God doesn't care if I eat steak on Friday? And it becomes this sort of discussion and too easily slips into who's right and who's wrong instead of remembering that humanity is one big family and as such we need to still be civil to one another at the end of the day if we're all members of the same team to use a different metaphor we need to be ready to work together when we get out on the field if I have a flat tire along the road and everyone knows that that I was into alternative spirituality, that I have alternative perspectives on all sorts of things, and I do. Does that mean that for that reason, because I wasn't following their dogma, they would not stop and help me along the road if I had a flat tire with my car, or if I was stranded somewhere, or if I ran out of food, or if my house is on fire, does that mean that the firefighters who went to some conservative Christian church, would not come and put the fire out on my house. If Is that a justification for not helping the person in need? If you're a Christian in any sense of the word, I come back to the, the basic teaching of Jesus in, in the parable of the sheep and the goats that, well, Lord, when did we see you hungry and not feed you? When did we see you naked and not clothe you? And, and the final conclusion is always, Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. We extend to others the same sort of kindness we would want to receive if we were in the same situation. In having these sorts of discussions in, within our communities, the whole community, in its religious diversity, without compromising its religious diversity, can come to practices that benefit everyone in the community, so that in the community, regardless of religion, there is no one who is going hungry, there is no one who is homeless, there is no one who is naked, there is no one who is in need because the community is looking out for everybody within its geographical or, or interactive boundaries. And being able to talk about religion in conversational circles, the first thing we have to remember is that we have to still be friends with everyone in this room when we leave this room. We have to understand that there's probably someone in the room who disagrees with me. So I need to own my own opinion and I need to express that this is, this is how I feel now. My opinion may change in the future. This is what I base my opinion on. And I very much want to hear what your opinion is also, and I want to know why you believe what you do. Not so that I can pick it apart and find something wrong with it, but so that I can understand how you think, and how you feel, and how you believe, and in that understanding, we can become better collaborators with each other. And that whether whether I believe in your way of practicing spirituality and religion or not, if you need a new altar cloth or uh, a bell to ring at certain points in your service and you don't have one and I have one I could loan you, well, here, go enjoy your service. Go enjoy whatever spiritual ritual you need to do. Because if you, in, if you are able to practice your spirituality with integrity and in a way that makes you happy, I'm going to be living in a community of happy people. To the extent to which people are not able to live with integrity, to practice their spirituality and their faith in whatever ways they choose, we find ourselves living in communities that are broken and fractured and that have animosity and hostility and enmity. And no one wins. No one wins in that situation. This is Society is not a pathetic children's game of King of the Hill in which nobody ever wins. It's just a succession of who's pushing whom off the highest point. Instead, my recommendation has always been that we join hands around the hill and don't worry about whether the person holding your hand on your left and right is exactly like you or not. 
because there is nothing about touching that hand that will magically transform you into being just like that person. It's not, I, it's not like a disease that's catching. They have their personal characteristics and you have yours. You each have beliefs that you've chosen for different reasons. Perhaps the most frustrating part of the discussion, and, and I wonder if the real reason people don't want to discuss religion in social settings is because most people haven't thought about their religious practices enough to know why they believe what they do. And they don't want to have to wrestle with figuring it all out. They don't want to have to live with the mystery of things that they can't answer. And yet, that's a big part of what life is. Why do people die at the times that they do in the circumstances that they do? I had one friend who lived in Montana and was out walking on a high plateau and there were gray clouds overhead but there wasn't a rumble of thunder to be heard anywhere and suddenly there was a lightning strike and a flash and she was killed by a bolt of lightning. Totally freak accident. Why did that happen? What does God have to do with that? How does it fit within the bigger picture of life? A lot of those are questions that can't be answered from our human perspective. They're things that we'll have to to ask God when we get to heaven, I suppose. For the atheist, who may or may not believe in a divine being and a heaven and so forth, there is still this mystery of the universe. And where does the energy of me go at the time that I die? And do I become part of the universe again? And does any part of the memories and experiences that I have accumulated here, any part of the wisdom that I've accumulated here, does it somehow infuse the energy that goes out into the universe? And how could the universe be so perfectly balanced? And, and yet it is. And I am not here to judge any, anyone's belief system, least of all the atheists. It is ultimately about how we relate to that which is greater than ourselves. But my encouragement to the Christian, the Jew, the Muslim, the pagan, the atheist, and all across the board is simply that whatever belief system you have developed or if you're in the process of developing, that it be one that answers those questions in a way that makes you a wiser and more loving person. If the goal of conversation, of discussing religion, is specifically about how to become wiser and more loving people. And if everyone remembers that, okay, we have a diversity of religions represented in the room, and we have a diversity of experiences represented in the room, but somehow we still are all teammates. We're all part of, of the family of humanity trying to find the wisest and most loving way to get through our lives, to deal with whatever our challenges are. The Additional reason, I guess, I would, well, it's kind of complex reasons, I guess. Two different areas come to mind. One is that different religious approaches refer to the divine in particular ways. There may be a particular branch of Christianity that insists upon referring to God as Father. I am not going to try to shove that theological perspective on a young woman who was molested by her father or her stepfather. For her, perhaps, um, only she can decide, perhaps it would be more effective to try a neo-pagan approach to spirituality, which frequently turns to conceptions of a divine mother or perhaps a more scientific perspective that divorces it from human form altogether and looks at the majesty and mystery of the universe in the way that, that Einstein was in awe of the universe and by being in awe of the universe found himself to be a deeply religious man but not in any way that the established churches and synagogues would necessarily recognize in his own unique way. In contemplating what is at the heart of spirituality and in having talked with people from a wide variety of different spiritual paths, 
uh, Muslim, pagan, Christian, and so on, I do find it fascinating that all the different people who have spoken of having experiences of God, whatever you conceive God to be, that in every case the primary emotion is awe. It's not arrogance, it's not confidence, it's not fear, it's not anger, it's not joy, it's awe. As if for one moment you touch the fingertip of something so much bigger than yourself and so much wiser than yourself and so much more loving than yourself that all you can feel is is awe. You're, you're speechless. You don't even know how to appropriately respond. The word thank you is so inadequate. It is just an awe that fills you and somehow takes you beyond the mere confines of your physical body into a place where you forget about time. And in a sense, I think it's a place where the Spirit is listening and where the Divine can speak in whatever ways the Divine wishes to speak. And brilliant discoveries may come, deep inner healing may come, all sorts of different things may come. I don't think the theology is as important as the fact that the healing and the learning and the wholeness come. And But to do this, well, I'm not here to give you a recipe card and say these are the steps you follow and ta-da, you'll have pleasant religious conversations. In every case, it's up to the individuals who are there who understand to whatever degree what their relationships and their understandings of each other are, that they listen to each other, that they respect each other as having an experience about which they can speak confidently not necessarily with clarity, because a lot of times we're trying to speak about mysterious experiences. But the only thing anyone can really be an expert about is their own, is her, his or her own experience. To say that I am an expert on your experience makes absolutely no sense, because I will never have complete access to all the information relative to your experience. I didn't feel it, I didn't think it, I didn't see it from the unique way that only you will see it. And being able to talk about religion with other people, part of it, to me, is finally getting to the place where you can consider the possibility that you may learn something for, through the other person or through the other person's spirituality. It doesn't necessarily mean that the other person is any more right or wrong than you or you know, there may be a conservative Christian who wouldn't want to hear something from a Muslim because, well, that's not the true religion as far as I'm concerned. And they may never say that, but it may be what they believe. To such a perspective, I would nonetheless say, don't tie God's hands. If God decides to speak to you through the words and sacred texts of a Muslim, make sure you're listening. If God decides to speak to a Muslim through the sacred, sacred text and words of a Christian, make sure you're listening. If God decides to speak to an atheist through a, a theological sacred text, and what the atheist notices within that is a mystery that is totally fascinating, but, what, but largely unexplored, that too could be considered a divine communication. That something that, regardless of the channel, if it's something that comes to you and moves you to a place of awe and a place of growth and learning, why would you not embrace that? It, it makes no sense to say, I want to be no more than I am now, never ever. I mean, if, if you really don't want to grow, then that's essentially where life has ended. And all you're doing is putting in time until we finally bury the body. I'm not recommending suicide by saying that, though. What I'm recommending is that you recognize how pointless it is to live without living, and instead of suicide, open yourself up to the question and to the dialogue 
and understand that you will still have the freedom to say what you believe and what you don't believe and, and you can, whatever God says to you through whatever channel, you can argue with God too. I don't think God minds that. And if anything, I think God will appreciate the fact that you're interested enough to invest yourself in that kind of heated discussion with, with God about something you believe in. You know, you, even if it's arguing about, you know, God, I don't believe that you're there. You know, if you are there, you'll have to prove it to me, but whether you believe or whether you don't doesn't make any difference to me. It doesn't impact my life. It impacts yours. Our beliefs about the divine don't change the divine. The divine is or is not whatever it is. The only thing the beliefs change is our experience of the divine and consequently our experience of life. in being able to talk about these things with each other respectfully without saying I'm right and you're wrong and this is the way it is and that's all there is to it. I don't know that any human being has the, the wisdom, the breadth of perspective, the experience to be able to say that with any legitimacy. And they don't need to because it's not really what life is about. Life is about the learning and the growing and about putting ourselves out there. But if we don't share the spiritual parts of ourselves, we will never learn what somebody else knows. And we will never learn whether what they know applies to our lives as well, or to what degree it applies. And in not listening to them, I suspect they won't want to listen to us either. And we won't be friends. And we may be members of the human family in the larger sense of the word, but we will make it so much more difficult to function as family to one another. And all future generations could pay the price for that. It is specifically by sharing our faith perspectives and our spiritual perspectives and, and even for the Christian to say, this is what my church teaches, but this is what I experienced. And I don't know how to put the two together and to ask a neo-pagan and a Muslim and a Jew and an atheist and anyone, whoever it be, to say, how do you answer this and how do you answer this and how do you answer this? And to compare and contrast those answers and see what common threads you find. There may be a fascinating new way of looking at your own spirituality that never occurred to you until that discussion happened by not having conversations about religion in a civil, mutually respectful manner where we understand that we're all trying to figure it out and we've all come to different conclusions and all of our conclusions will change. Without having those conversations, we could be stunting our own spiritual growth because God may have decided that your spiritual growth is going to be facilitated by the least likely source. Kind of like Balaam the prophet in the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, being summoned, he was, he was not a Jew, he was not a Christian, but he had a communication line with God. And it was, he was renowned for being able to do blessings and curses, in, and lo and behold, it would actually happen. And so the Israelites are coming into the Promised Land, and without getting into all the global social ramifications of that. The only point I wanted to point, the only point I wanted to make was by bringing up the story of Balaam and his interaction with God. That he wasn't a Christian, he wasn't a Jew, he wasn't any of the dominant religions, but he had a relationship with God by which he, he genuinely was communicating with God. And a king summoned him and said, come curse these people, because I've heard it said that what you curse is cursed and what you bless is blessed. And so Balaam is on his way there, and suddenly his donkey veers off the road into the brush, and, and he whacks it with a cane to steer it back onto the road, and goes a little further, and it veers off the other side of the road, and, and he whacks it with his cane to get it back onto the road, and it's like, what is with you, you stupid donkey? And about that time, it says that his eyes were opened, and he saw an angel standing in the middle of the road with a flaming sword. And... Basically, at that point, it was literally an oh my God sort of moment as he realized uh, what was going on. And it says that God opened the mouth of the donkey. And the donkey looked at him and said, 
why have you beat me these times and I was just trying to protect you. And so this is a man literally talking, having a conversation with the donkey and the donkey warning him and then he sees the angel and and then he stops long enough to have a conversation with God and asks, so what am I supposed to do to serve this moment rather than arrogantly thinking I'm going to control the moment? What should I do to serve the moment? And uh, suggesting that God has a sense of humor, the, the point I always come back to with this story is that it, it suggests that in order to be the mouth of God and speak the words that God wants spoken, you really don't have to be any better than a jackass. Of course, that would assume that God has a sense of humor, which he might. In any case, there's a lot that can be said, but if any one of us is concerned with being no better than a jackass, being as honest and kind and considerate as we can, speaking whatever comes into our minds and hearts, and hoping that maybe God will use it to educate somebody else. We can have civil discussions and we can nurture each other's personal growth instead of avoiding it in ways that tie God's hands.